Good morning, everyone. Nice to see your faces. Uh, it's nice also that it's a bit cooler this morning. I had a very, very hot week on Salt Spring uh, last week on vacation. I'm very glad that it's a bit cooler this morning. Uh, we have a few quick announcements in the back of the bulletin. Um, the first is uh, it's a pretty busy, busy, uh, pretty busy week next week. Uh, next week we have our uh, last Agape service at St. Martin's. Uh, and then we also follow it with a Deeper Connections uh, uh, meeting on September 6th at 7 p.m. Uh, both of those uh, are here in, uh, in the parish, uh, but you can join by Zoom if you wish. Uh, and then uh, Saturday, September 10th, we are hosting... Oh, sorry. The Agape is going to be on the 4th. The 4th, that's right. And then Deeper Connections is on the 6th. Oh, there's another, of course, yes, there's another weekend. So two weekends, from, I'm sorry, two weekends from now, there's an Agape service. And then on the sixth, there's a, um, the Deeper Connections. And then that coming Saturday, uh, so September 10th, uh, we are hosting the regional pilgrimage uh, of all of the local parishes coming through uh, the, the, this deanery. And so we'll be seeing people coming through here and you're very welcome to join for that portion of the pilgrimage or, um, or to attend the whole pilgrimage. Uh, details are in the back of the leaflet. Um, then there's uh, a joint service with St. John's on September 11th. The St. John's congregation will be coming here. Uh, there will be uh, baptisms that weekend um, and a, a, a celebratory meal in the parish hall. Speaking of baptisms, uh, we have a baptism happening here uh, next week if, uh, if all things go in order. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, shoot. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Okay. <laughs> okay. I will chat after the darn. Okay. <laughs> I'll keep trying as long as, as long as there's a willing uh, baby in the midst. So, um, uh, uh, don't forget David Millard's farewell organ recital is scheduled for September 17th. Uh, put it in your calendars if you can. And I think there's, oh yes, uh, Anne's not here this morning, um, but I'm, uh, I'm very happy to announce that Anne has been uh, nominated and, has, uh, and will receive the Order of the Diocese of New Westminster this year. Uh, it's, it's a great honor for Anne and uh, uh, there will be a investiture service held on Saturday, uh, the 5th of November uh, at the Massey Theater in New Westminster. We'll be putting this into the leaflet um, uh, this coming Sunday and onwards. Um, Anne would really love to see your faces there. And I think it's a real honor for Anne. Uh, she's been uh, such a great volunteer and, uh, and has served us all so faithfully. And this is a, a wonderful honor for her. Uh, there was another announcement about, we are missing a computer charger. So if you have an older style computer with the kind of the prong charger insert, you know, the one with the little circle that you plug into the laptop. If you happen to have one of those, um, you could maybe save us uh, 35 40 dollars and uh, and just let me know by email and uh, and we can plug it in otherwise we'll find another solution are there any other announcements this morning yes Janet. absolutely thank you janet and uh is there coffee hour today i forgot to ask there is wonderful all right, we'll all see each other in coffee hour after worship. Any other announcements? Oh, yes. You might notice that the, uh, at the back of the leaflet, uh, our eagle-eyed Heather noticed that in the, the um, uh, sorry, uh, what page is it? Page 13, uh, you'll see that there's a Sunday prayer cycle for the Diocese of New Westminster, and that uh, under the Gibson's Parish, which is known as uh, St. Aidan and St. Bartholomew, it's listed uh, the Venerable Stephen Muir, the Reverend Stephen Bailey, and the Reverend Clarence Lee. And uh, Heather was wondering if this was a mistake. It is not a mistake. 
uh, Stephen Muir, being the wonderful guy that he is, is serving as the interim uh, priest in charge for the parish in Gibsons while they find a priest. Uh, Clarence Lee is taking uh, Sunday services there, and I presume Stephen Bailey is as well. Uh, so it's not a typo. Great. Any other any other questions, comments? Okay. Uh, we'll have a moment of silence before worship begins. Our Sabbath day worship begins with hymn number four. The community of St. Martin's acknowledges that we live, work, and worship on the ancestral and unceded land of the Coast Salish peoples, the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. May the reconciling love of Christ be reflected in our words and in our actions. The Lord be with you. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts be open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Everyone is invited to be seated, and if there are any children in the congregation, you're invited to join me at the front. Wow. 
Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Do you want to sit? Yeah. Hi, how are you? You're, I know you're Allison. Yeah, how are you? You've been on a trip? Where did you go? So, oh, I was on Salt Spring this week too. That's amazing. We were on Salt Spring together. Do you love Salt Spring? Yeah. Yeah, me too. I could see kitty cats. You could see kitty cats. Did you see anything else? You saw Nana and Papa? Are those your grandparents? Wow, that's pretty special. Welcome back. I'm glad you're here. I'm back too. That gets, that's pretty fun. Um, Allison, do you play any sports? Yeah, what sports do you play? Soccer? Wow, can you tell me about soccer? Are there, what rules are there in soccer? Just playing, yeah. Can you touch the ball with your hand? You can, if you're the goalie, right? But otherwise you have, to, you have to kick the ball with your feet, right? Yeah, that's a rule. You can't touch soccer balls with your hands, right? What else? Mm, do you think one of the parents on the sidelines could jump into the game and play the game with you? Well, they could. I think that's probably a rule that you can't. Are there any other? You got swimming lessons. Are there any rules when you're swimming? What are the rules when you're swimming? Oh yeah, you blow bubbles and you find treasures when you're swimming. Yeah, are you allowed to be in the pool all by yourself? You are? You are? Oh, your mama's saying you're not allowed to. Your mama's saying you're not allowed to be in the pool all by yourself. Are you allowed to run around the pool? No, that's a rule too, right? So uh, this, this morning, we're gonna tell a story about Jesus and, uh, and some, some people have some rules. They're telling Jesus what he can't do. So I'll tell you the story. So there's this woman who, uh, who was really sick. So imagine you had to stand your whole life, except you had to bow the whole time. You couldn't look up. That's what it was like for her. She was living with this kind of, with, um, with her, uh, let's say her back was really hurt. And Jesus on Sunday morning, uh, healed her and some people said you're not allowed to do that on a sunday morning you're not allowed to work on a sunday morning you're supposed to be worshiping and jesus said you silly people we're supposed to help people on sunday mornings um so sometimes we can kind of pause games like soccer right we can pause the game when someone gets hurt so if someone's hurt on the field we can say okay let's pause the game stop all the rules all the adults can come onto the field now right? Or if someone's in trouble in your swimming pool, do you think it's okay if the lifeguard breaks the rule and runs next to the swimming pool? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's okay for the lifeguard to run because it's really important to get to somebody that's maybe drowning in the pool, right? Yeah. So um, that's what Jesus is doing. He's saying, sometimes it's okay to break a rule if you're going to help someone that's hurt. So uh, Jesus is saying, you know what's more important than rules? You are more important than rules. Because Jesus loves you so much, the rules kind of don't count sometimes. Does that sort of make sense? Sort of? Yeah? Okay. Um, is there anything else you want to say to the congregation before we have a prayer? No? Okay. Uh, it's really nice that you're here today, and your brother too. He's only one, I know. And you're five. Yeah. Do you want to know, you want to know how old I am? I'm 44. Is that really old? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay, let's, uh, do you know how to do a repeat after me prayer? So I'll say a couple words and then you just repeat the words. Does that sound good? So I'm going to say, uh, can you repeat this? Dear God. Dear God. And maybe everybody else can join too. So dear God. Thank you for Jesus. Who shows us yes. how you love us yes. more than anything else? Help us love each other in the exact same way. Thank you and amen.
All right, thank you. You can go back to your seat if you want. You too. Let us pray. Almighty God, we are taught by your word that all our doings without love are worth nothing. Send your Holy Spirit and pour into our hearts that most excellent gift of love and true bond of peace and of all virtue through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We sit to listen for the word of God. The first lesson is written in the book of prophet Jeremiah, the first chapter beginning at the fourth verse. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Mm -hmm. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. The word of the Lord.
The second lesson is written in the letter to the Hebrews, the 12th chapter, beginning at the 18th verse. You have not come to something that can be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that not another word be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even an animal touches the mountain, it shall be stoned to death. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel, so that you do not refuse the one who is speak speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused, the one who warned them on earth, how much less will we escape if we reject the one who warns from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yes, yes once more I will shake, not only the earth, but also the heaven. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of what is shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us give thanks by which we offer to God an acceptable worship, with reverence and awe, for indeed our God is a consuming fire. The word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel is written in the 13th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke, beginning at the 10th verse. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Women, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she, stu she stood up straight 
and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger or lead it away to give it to water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame. And the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. The Gospel of Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Some of you especially eager Anglicans will know that all the bishops of the Anglican communion met at the Lambeth conference this summer. For those of you that don't know, Lambeth is a meeting of the worldwide Anglican Episcopate that occurs roughly once every 10 years, give or take a few years to avoid schisms and pandemics. Now, just as a matter of personal interest, my grandfather, uh, Bishop Eric Munn, was the Bishop of Caledonia, which is based out of Prince Rupert, British Columbia. And he attended Lambeth, Lambeth Conference in 1968, uh, the Lambeth Conference, which endorsed the ordination of women to the diaconate. There, whilst visiting a friend during a break at Lambeth, he had a severe stroke and died several months afterwards. So Lambeth plays this big role in my family. After this year's Lambeth Conference, there's a fair bit of talk about um, there's a fair bit of controversy, uh, including further controversies around issues of human sexuality and gender, issues that are tied up with power and control of the future of the church. But thankfully, that's not the controversy I wanna talk about today. For that, for, the, for that controversy that I wanna talk about today, I want us to stretch our minds back 134 years to the 1888 Lambeth Conference. What was the church focused on in the 1888 Lambeth Conference? It's okay if you don't know, uh, virtually nobody knows this. Well, it was the observance of the Sabbath of all things. Together, the bishops in 1888 released a report that said in part, and I'll quote here, the principle of the religious observation of one day in seven is of divine and primeval obligation and was afterwards embodied in the fourth commandment. The observance of the Lord's day as a day of rest, of worship, and of religious teaching has been a priceless blessing in all Christian lands in which it has been maintained. The growing license in its observance threatens a grave change in its sacred and beneficent character. The increasing practice on the part of some of the wealthy and leisurely classes 
of making the day a day of secular amusement is most strongly to be deprecated. The most careful regard should be had to the danger of any encroachment upon the rest, which on this day is the right of servants as well as their masters and of the working classes as well as their employers. That's from 1888. I don't know if that was easy to hear or understand given some of the antiquated language. What we hear articulated as far back as 1888 is a worldwide church vexed with the Sabbath day becoming a day of amusement and recreation for the wealthy and concern that people who have to work for a living not getting a day of rest. The Sabbath day is central to who we are as Christians. It is mentioned hundreds of times in the Bible. And yet, the wider culture has largely lost the memory of a true Sabbath day. I'm probably the last generation, even a few years after me, I don't think anybody will remember when Sunday was really a day off for everybody. There was nothing open. There were no grocery stores. There were no fast food restaurants, nothing, just a day off for everyone. People three years younger than me, I, I think have no recollection of that. As far as I can tell, this was not a pressing concern for the bishops gathered at this year's Lambeth conference. We instead talked about sex something about which the Bible has vanishingly little to say. Why, though, would we talk about the Sabbath now? Why is the Sabbath important? Well, we are a society driven and riven by relentless change and informational overload, by technologies that were unfathomable even 10 years ago, by social media and traditional media that feed us news and opinions at all times of day and night, by the values of achievement and competition that leave differently abled people behind, by relentless consumerism and fashion that is exhausting and depleting the earth and the poor who produce it all. Surely the subject of Sunday observance or a Sabbath might be a topic that our religious leaders may wish to tackle. What might Christianity and Anglicanism, Anglicanism have to say about the importance of keeping a day of the week as a day set aside for rest, for worship, for thanksgiving, and a focus on spiritual values? What might we as Christians and Anglicans have to say about the need for the earth's recovery? What might we have to say about centering ourselves in a sacred identity, divorced from productivity, wealth, achievement, fashion, and others' opinions of us? Might not this issue be more pressing in the lives of more Anglicans and earthlings than all the other stuff that captured the headlines about Lambeth 2022. In our gospel reading this morning from Luke, we find Jesus in conflict with religious leaders who have attacked him for healing a woman on the Sabbath day. Jesus insists that in healing the woman, he is setting her free from bondage to Satan just as anyone would untie an animal to show it compassion, how much better is it to loose someone from the powers that work against human health, wholeness, and freedom as Jesus has done? Now reading this story, it all seems pretty straightforward. Who would not agree with healing this woman, even if it's on the Sabbath? Surely, compassion and dignity and grace are permitted every day of the week, right? Yes, Jesus, this legalistic view of the Sabbath is just cruel and backwards. Yes, Jesus, thank God we are no longer weighed down by religious edicts from religious elites 
that prevent us from doing commonsensical and important things for others and ourselves. Thank God we don't live in a society that shuts down every seven days to observe someone else's religious ideal. And perhaps this is where we run into trouble. At first reading, the religious leaders in our gospel reading seem like straw men or women, bad legalistic religious leaders and their hypocrisy. Good for us who can see human need. Aren't we quick to say, thank God we don't even have to worry about a, such a silly subject as the Sabbath day. We can focus on sex instead. But in doing so, are we taking the religious leader in this gospel seriously, as seriously as Jesus does? Are we taking God's gift of a Sabbath day seriously? And it's not just a gift, it's a command. Not a suggestion, a command to take a Sabbath day. The gospel story, it seems, is about Jesus setting us free from a legal observance of the Sabbath. But what does that mean? What are we set free for? Was it to make every day a work day? To add another 24 hours to our labor? To add another day of resource extraction? Was it Jesus' purpose that those who serve us never have a day off? like those fast food workers or grocery store clerks or movie theater staff that work our weekends? Was it his purpose that they not share in communal rest days, like Labor Day and Family Day or Sunday? Are we set free by Jesus simply to consume again on the seventh day, to accumulate and purchase and acquire even more? Are we set free so that every day of our children's lives can be structured and programmed and scheduled so that they can never miss another chance to compete with each other, strive to get ahead of other children, or try to keep up with everyone if they're behind? So that they can add another activity to a long list that will be tallied by the university admissions office years from now? Some of these things, I admit, are good things in and of themselves. We do need to eat food. Children can thrive in sport and so on. But is there a price we are paying as a society when we can't or won't designate one day in seven as a day of Sabbath? Or how about just one day in 365? Apparently, People of God have long struggled with how to keep this commandment appropriately. In Isaiah, the prophet pronounces these words. If you refrain from the trampling of the Sabbath, from pursuing your own interests on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways, serving your own interests, or pursuing your own affairs, then you shall take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride upon the heights of the earth. Perhaps this ancient reading still shines light on our path. The problem for Isaiah's audience was that people were pursuing their own interests, not God's honoring their own purposes, not God's. It's no accident that the prophet connects their faulty observances of Sabbath with issues of justice, such as feeding the hungry and meeting the needs of the afflicted. Sabbath, it seems, through the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, is a justice issue. If we ignore God's purposes for Sabbath, just as we ignore hungry people, things are not going to turn out all right. So what does God intend for Sabbath? If we're set free from the law of the Sabbath, what are we set free for? We are free for rest. 
We need rest. We all need it. Adults and children, executives, bus drivers, students, teachers, nurses, homemakers, animals of all kinds, apparently ecosystems in our planet, all of us. We are creatures and we are created. We're mortals. Resting reminds us that we are creatures with real bodily needs to stop, replenish, and rest. Last night, writing this sermon, it occurred, it occurred to me to ask a fast food worker about their work. So I walked up the street to McDonald's and asked a Filipino server if this was her only job. And she said that it wasn't. She works a second job as a house cleaner. I asked her how many days a week she works. She says, every day. I said, are you kidding? And she said, no, but that she takes two weeks a year to see her family back in the Philippines. And she goes to church on Sunday mornings. I told her I was a priest writing about the Sabbath and economic justice. And I asked her how much she makes an hour. And she told me she makes $15 and 65 cents an hour. I calculated that her flight home every year is equal to six weeks of her wages full time. Rest is a justice issue. We need working conditions, an economy where people can make a living wage, where no one needs to work two jobs to make ends meet, where no one works every day to provide for their family. We are free to remember our dependency on God. Sabbath reminds us that God is God and we can stop trying to be God. We can rest, worshiping that which gives us life, giving thanks for all we are and have been given. We are freed to worship, to immerse ourselves in God's eternity, in a place and a time set aside like this morning, in an activity in which we produce nothing but praise, where we, you, are valued, not because of what you make or do or earn or deserve or what you know or contribute or achieve, but because you are created by God and loved by God. If, as our reading from Hebrew states, our God is a consuming fire, then worship gives us a place in which all that seems so needful during the rest of the week, all those identities and pressures that are placed on us that don't reflect our sacred identity, here all those things can be burned away. And we can trust simply and wholly in the presence of God. The woman cured by Jesus on that Sabbath must have experienced all this in gaining her freedom. She experienced rest from the physical stress of her deformity. What a relief for her. This woman experienced reliance on her God who was interested in healing her and restoring her, who loved her who broke down social barriers that prevented her from living a full life in communion with others. And in this woman, we see the example of the true worship experience, worship in the truest sense and the praise that left from her lips for what God had done for her. Jesus makes a point about the Sabbath, that it is meant as a day of rest, for this woman too. His is a lesson worth learning. But this woman too, far from being a passive recipient of God's care, has become our example of how to observe and experience the Sabbath. What about us? How shall we keep Sabbath in our own day?
Please stand as you're able. I believe in one God. Please stand, sit, or kneel, as is your custom for prayer. In peace, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. This past week has been marked by the struggles of people for power to either retain it or to gain it or to avoid losing it. In places like Ukraine, Mogadishu, and in the United States of America. For peace from on high and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for John our Bishop and for all the clergy, Mark and others and people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord. For Elizabeth, our queen, for the leaders of the nations and for all in authority, let us pray to the Lord. Lord. For the city, for North Vancouver city and district, for every city and community, and for those who live in them in faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord. For good weather and for abundant harvests, for all to share, let us pray to the Lord. Lord. For those who travel by land, water, or air, for the sick and the suffering, 
Let us name in our hearts or aloud those for particular concern. For prisoners and captives and for their safety, health and salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord. For our deliverance from all affliction, strife and need, let us pray to the Lord. Lord. And in our diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for St. Aidan and St. Bartholomew in Gibsons, which is now without its own clergy, and for the people who are keeping it going. The Venerable Stephen Muir, who is priest in charge, the Reverend Stephen Bailey, and the Reverend Clar Clarence Lee. We also pray for the Archdeaconry of Lougheed, the Venerable Kelly Duncan, Regional Archdeacon. And we pray too for our, the people of our companion parish, St. Leo the Great, San Sudan, and San Louis Mapa'e in the Diocese of the Northern Philippines. And we remember also in our own parish prayer rota, Eleanor, El, and Brian. For all these and others, let us pray to the Lord. For all who have died, especially those who have worshiped with us here at St. Martin's, let us pray to the Lord. Lord. Remembering Martin and all the saints, we commit ourselves, one another, and our whole life to Christ our God. Amen. Amen. Ye that do earnestly repent you of your sins and are in love and charity with your neighbors and intend to lead the new life, following the commandments of God and walking from henceforth in holy ways, draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to your comfort and make your humble confession to almighty God. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all people, we acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, word, and deed against thy divine majesty. We do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, for thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee in newness of life, to the honor and glory of thy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God in heaven, who in great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all them that with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please stand as you are able. The peace of the Lord be always with you.
Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, forever and ever. All that is in heaven and in the earth is thine. All things come of thee, and of thine own have we given thee. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is very meet, right, and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty, everlasting God, creator and preserver of all things. For thou art the fountain of light and life for all thy creation. Thou hast made us in thine own image and dost raise us to new life in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and singing. Blessing and glory and thanksgiving be unto thee, almighty God, our heavenly Father, who of thy tender mercy gives give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to take our nature upon him and to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there, by his one oblation of himself, once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction, for the sins of the whole world, and did institute, and in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memorial of that his precious death until his coming again. Hear us, O merciful Father, we most humbly beseech thee, and grant that we receiving these thy creatures of bread and wine, according to thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it in remembrance of me. Wherefore, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, we thy humble servants with all thy holy church remembering the precious death of thy beloved Son, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming again in glory, do make before thee in this sacrament of the holy bread of eternal life and the cup of everlasting salvation, the memorial which he hath commanded. And we entirely desire thy fatherly goodness mercifully to accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving most humbly beseeching thee to grant that by the merits and death of thy son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and all thy whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. 
And we pray that by the power of thy Holy Spirit, all we who are partakers of this Holy Communion may be fulfilled with thy grace and heavenly benediction. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, by whom and with whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. Amen.
And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. Please stand as you're able. May the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. Amen.
in peace to rest, to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.